welcome to our gathering here this morning as we worship together online. It's great that we can still gather together to praise God and think about his love despite the frustrations again of lockdown and the disappointment of this. We can remember God's love and care and the fact that he hides us in the shadow of his wings and holds us in the palm of his hand. As the words of Psalm 40 say, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and trust in the Lord and put their trust in him. We're going to hand over now to Sid for a time of worship. This song is a good, fun song. It talks about no matter what I'm going to face tomorrow, I'm going to face it with the Lord Jesus, with God himself. So let's sing. It's a bit of a family song, but also a song that all of us can sing. some announcements for you now. During the month of July we have our Hope Street collection which is a great chance to give to those who need our love and support and show God's care and the items that we can purchase for this are listed in the church newsletter. You can drop these outside the church office during office hours on Tuesday or Thursday or else you can ring Di Copeland and she'll come and pick them up for you. Secondly we have an annual general church meeting on Sunday the 15th of August at 3 p.m. And you can see the church newsletter for more details of this. We're also updating our church directory, which is a great way for us to um, love and serve each other and keep in touch. So if you can go to the website and follow the link or follow the QR code and fill in the form for that, that would be great. We also have a morning tea after this on Zoom for those who'd like to join us. And finally, I'm going to pray for the offertory and it's Important to remember during these times that um, we still need to keep giving to the work of God and that helps encourage others and it also helps support people who are doing it tough through these times. So we can still give by um, donating directly to the church bank account on the CIF. You can find the details on the web page. I'm just going to pray now. Lord Jesus, thank you for blessing us with abundance in this country, Lord, and just Lord, just um, thank you that we have the means to give to others and to help them. Help us just to be able to um, give generously, Lord, 
and Lord just uphold those who um, have lost their jobs uh, and in need at the moment. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the one who has promised to be our God forever, our Saviour, our Shepherd, our Refuge, our Rock, our exceeding great reward. And we know that you are a promise-keeping God, that all your promises are yes in Jesus. We praise you for your goodness to us, how blessed we are to be your people. We trust you, we seek you, we cling to you. We don't like to think about our weaknesses and our sinfulness, but you know the full extent of them and still you don't turn your face from us. And as we confess where we've gone wrong and admit our need of your help, you forgive and cleanse us. Thank you. You know the challenges of the days we find ourselves in. We are thankful that you have numbered them already. We are as a world, a country, a city, a suburb, a church in your hands. We seek your mercy and intervention. We ask that the lockdown would halt the spread of COVID that our nation's leaders would use the powers you have given them wisely, that you would care for the sick and isolated, that you would give strength and endurance to healthcare workers, and that you would bring comfort that strengthens to your churches as we minister in our communities. And Father, even as we struggle ourselves Keep us faithful to pray for our missionaries and the needs of other people in other places. For your plans for us at Carlingford Baptist, we thank you. We know we need to wait on you and we trust you to make the next steps clear to us. We bring to you the practical planning for upcoming meetings and events asking that you will give wisdom to our pastoral team and leaders. Father, there are many amongst us with pressing needs that the COVID situation makes harder to bear. We bring Caroline, Jenny, Irene and Ranald, Stan and Josie, Nancy, Paul, Doug, Bill and Michelle before you. Would you meet their needs in ways that bring relief, peace and healing? Where we can provide help in practical or spiritual ways, please make that clear. We also ask for your grace to be very real to our pastoral care team, as they use the gifts you have given them to provide encouragement and loving support. Father, we thank you for our time together and for those who have served to make this online service possible. We would go now willing to receive what you give, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you require and to do what you send us to do. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It's May here. And hi, I'm Emma. And uh, we are doing another quick announcement. And we are speaking to you in the future. Well, almost. We are recording this one week early because I will be on leave next week. So we're not sure what's going to happen next week when you're actually watching this. Oh, yeah, because only God knows what's going to happen in the future. That's exactly right, May. And Things are pretty crazy at the moment with COVID-19 going on. We're in the middle of lockdown, or at least we're in the middle of lockdown, and I'm not sure about you. So you might be at church or at home. But whatever you're doing, you can still get involved in the CBC Kids Online Kids Church. Yes, 
So head along to our website and click on the links to head to um, the service page and then down to Kids Church and you'll find all the resources there to do Kids Church at home or if you are at church, then it will be running the same stuff at church as well. And we're finding out about some people who had some daring faith and prayed and trusted in God who did amazing things, more than they could possibly imagine. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And we hope that these stories encourage you because these are ordinary people, just like you and I, who prayed and trusted in God and he did amazing, wonderful things. Wow, can't wait to find out more. Well. Bye for now, everybody. See you next time. Bye. The Bible reading is Psalm 63, a Psalm of David, when he was in the desert of Judah. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Hey everyone, it's so lovely to be with you uh, today. It's been a bit of a wild couple weeks for everyone, I'm sure. So uh, I hope and pray that today's psalm will be an encouragement to you. We're carrying on in our uh, Praying the Psalm series today and we'll be looking at Psalm 63, which is a beautiful psalm. It, it's got a lot to teach us about intimacy with God and sort of living that out in the messiness of day-to-day -day life. So the opening descriptor here claims that this psalm was written by King David when he was in the desert of Judah. Uh, now, David wasn't out for a casual stroll in the desert, but a sunbaking. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I can tell you, as someone who has seen some of those deserts in Israel, it is not a place that you would want to go holiday. It, it is desolate and arid and so hot. <laughs> no, David is out in the desert for one of two reasons. One, he's either being relentlessly chased down, pursued and hunted by his father-in-law Saul and his armies in 1 Samuel 23 and 24. Or two, he's being relentlessly chased down, hunted and pursued by his son Absalom in 2 Samuel 17. So either way, it's not a great situation to be in. But here is where we are met with David's opening cry, a, a hunted man running for his life in a desolate desert where water is so sparse. You God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. It's funny how uh, quite often it's the really challenging situations in life that sort of recenter us, shake us up a bit, and bring us back to what's important. Bring us back to God. David turns to God in the midst of this terrible situation. He, he compares his spiritual longing for intimacy with God with, with an overpowering uh, physical desire that comes with an unmet thirst, something he was probably uh, all too 
well, some of you probably knew all too well. <laughs> His entire being everything he is yearns for this God, who is his God, who, who David has committed his life and his allegiance to. He longs for God like a sip of fresh water across the dried out cracked lips of a weary desert wanderer. He seeks God earnestly and intently with everything he has. I remember going to hospital when I was about 19 uh, for a water diabetes test, um, essentially because of the excessive amount of water that I'd gotten into the habit of drinking. And so what happens is they keep you in overnight and deprive you of water for a ridiculous number of hours. Um, and if you were used to drinking about seven liters a day like I was, it is very uncomfortable <laughs> to say the least. I. I remember lying on that bed just feeling nauseous and weak and just dr kind of daydreaming about when I was going to get uh, that fresh cup of water in the morning. And if I hadn't known that this was a very important test for me to do, and if there hadn't been a rather intimidate, intimidating nurse uh, patrolling the hallways, I would have most certainly leapt off that bed and gone searching every nook and cranny in that hospital until that thirst was satisfied. And in the same way, David becomes fixated on this very real spiritual need. He longs so desperately to know God's presence again like he has in the past, in such a feeling and intimate way. And I would think that for most of us, we would have experienced that spiritual dryness at some point in time and an overwhelming desire to quench that. And honestly, this terrifying and unthinkable situation that David finds himself in uh, could have caused David to doubt God's character and his goodness to reject his faith. I've been tempted to do that in the past, and I don't think that I'd be alone in that. But David doesn't do that. Instead, in verse 2, David reflects on his powerful past encounters with God, where he experienced God's power and his glory in the sanctuary. The sanctuary was the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. The, the uh, temple hadn't been built yet. Uh, but it was where God had promised that he would be present with his people. And David had experienced incredible enjoyment and fellowship with God there, leading him to proclaim, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. God's love causes David to praise him every day of his life, to worship him with singing and with hands held high in complete abandon. To David, God's love is better than life. David is so in love, so besotted with this God that he says, I can't live without you. I don't want to live without you. It almost sounds like a love song written by a boy band or a Romeo and Juliet situation, a, a youthful infatuation that drives you to do and say things that you uh, maybe don't totally understand. But that's not what's happening here. It's, it's not a casual throwaway line that David mutters in an emotional moment. No. If you've ever had a bad car crash or, or felt like you were going to drown, you'd know that you never value your life quite so much as when it's almost taken from you. And, and those first uh, shaky moments after a crash or that first huge gulp of fresh air feels incredibly precious. David knows what it's like to want to live, to fight, to see another day. And, and he says that God's love is more potent, more wonderful, more meaningful and more beautiful than even that desire to live. David has a mature relationship with God. He, he knows God's character personally, 
God's chesed, his loving kindness, his loyalty, his covenantal and steadfast love. David's personal relationship with God has persuaded him of who God is and that God does not change despite the difficulties in his life and in our lives as well. And because of this persuasion, David glorifies God in the midst of his troubles. He knows in whom he has believed. He has evidence of God's love in the past. He is convinced that the God who met him in the sanctuary when life was good and as it should be, will now meet him in the desolate desert when life is challenging and that he will satisfy his desire for friendship, relationship, comfort and protection. He believes that his spiritual need will be satisfied in the way that a banquet satisfies a grumbling stomach. David says, on my bed, I remember you. I think of you in the watches of the night. Not only does David seek God in the day, he remembers God throughout the three, four hour watches of the night. There are two ways you could take this. Uh, firstly, the language is reminiscent of a lover lying on their bed, uh, lying there awake, thinking about the one that their heart adores and sort of meditating on their good qualities. Other commentators suggest that considering David's predicament, the night time might rather be a time of fear and vulnerability where you could easily be attacked while you sleep. Either way, though, whether David turns to God in fear uh, and desiring comfort, or if he simply dwells on the Lord like a lover who has captured his heart, the fact is that David uh, spends his time meditating on God and God's good character, and that, and that speaks volumes about David's relationship with the Lord. This relationship is one of trust and, and love and admiration and friendship. David calls God his help in verse 7, under whose wings he takes shelter. The phrase uh, shadow of your wings is usually, usually used to describe someone approaching God in a time of trouble, which makes sense in David's situation. It's a picture of God as a mama hen fluffing out her feathers and gathering in her little chicks uh, under her wings for protection. Here in this troublesome time, again, David sings. Verse 7, I sing in the shadow of your wings. So confident is David in God's ability to rescue him that he chooses to praise God despite his difficulties. And David clings while he sings to God who sustains him and up upholds him with his mighty and powerful right hand. The word for cling here is the same word that's used in Genesis 2.24 to speak of the intimacy of marriage. It is a close, inseparable bond that David has with his beloved and powerful Yahweh. Now, we've come to an interesting fork in the road here. Uh, you may have been slightly uh, taken aback during the reading when we got to verses 9 to 11. Uh, they are somewhat confronting. They're sort of a, of the same style as what is called the imprecatory psalms. Uh, these are psalms that express hatred and a desire for one's enemies uh, to be punished. It really is the real elephant in the room, in a sense. This beautiful depiction of David's longing for an intimate relationship with God ends in bloodshed and with the desired death of his foes. So this, this is one of those difficult sections of the Bible that we kind of need to face head on. So let's reread these couple verses. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and will become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. These verses depict a war zone. 
to be given over to the sword is to die in battle while in like which in the wilderness would naturally lead to any lifeless bodies being eaten by jackals as a result the king will rejoice in god and his victory while his enemies lay silenced by death now none of that really appeals to our 21st century sensibilities but as we mentioned earlier david is being hunted by enemies who are intent on murdering him and whether this psalm references uh, the account of saul and his armies pursuing david or if it was his son absalom the fact remains that david still with had with him several hundred fighting men so in a way, it was natural for David, who was anointed and chosen by God, to speak with confidence uh, about the inevitable battle to come where God would grant him victory, uh, despite the unlikely odds. The whole way through this psalm, David has expressed confidence in God's abilities and, and who God is, his, his power and his protection and his love. And not in David himself or David's own abilities. David chooses uh, to believe in the covenant that God has made with him. And, and, and those who speak against David as God's chosen one will be justly silenced. As Christians, we often have a problem with the imprecatory Psalms, the angry, hateful ones. We, we think, well, what about love and, and forgiveness? Well, God does not change. And as we see in this psalm, God is a God of love in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. However, since God is love, he therefore hates evil and is a God of justice. Jesus himself encouraged his people to persevere in prayer because God, he said, is a just God and he will bring about justice for his children. Hatred for the sake of hatred is wrong. But the hatred of evil and wrongdoing is what these Psalms rightly express a sense of outrage about. And in a way, though it's not an excuse to act on these gut-wrenching emotions, these psalms do give us uh, the permission to express and offer our, our deepest regrets and anger and frustrations to God. On the cross, Jesus himself, quoting Psalm 22, cried out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our God desires an intimate relationship with, with us. He, he wants to hear our heart cry and he will listen when we call. The Christian author Blaise Pascal wrote uh, about something in the late 1600s, which has kind of commonly been uh, referred to as the God-shaped hole in our hearts. Uh, that, that hole or desire that can only be filled by God himself. In John 7, 37, Jesus cries out to the Jewish people, uh, telling them that if they're thirsty, meaning spiritually thirsty, they should come to him and drink. An intimate relationship with God made fully accessible through Jesus and his sacrificial death is the means of filling that God-shaped hole in our hearts and quenching that insatiable spiritual thirst that David talks about in this psalm. There is no longer any need for a tabernacle or a sanctuary because as Christians we are literally the temple of the Holy Spirit. He is with us. And we know this. We also know that deepening uh, that relationship with God and trusting in his character is what will allow us to sing in his presence, even in the midst of challenging life situations. And, and obviously we're blessed to have the written word uh, to teach us about who God is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to recount the words and actions of Jesus, 
who was God made flesh. But what about our conversations with God? What, what about our prayer? Well, David demonstrates here for us and in Psalm 51 last week that in order for our relationship with God to thrive, there needs to be a deep authenticity and a willingness to be seen by God. A vulnerable honesty that allows us to view him as our honoured friend and, and to bring to him the deepest desires and joys and frustrations of our heart. Brené Brown, uh, you might have heard her TED Talks uh, or seen her on Netflix. Um, she's a vulnerability researcher who explains that the research over the last 40 years has determined that the ability to be connected to others is what gives purpose and meaning to our lives as human beings. Neurobiologically, neurobiologically, that's how we're wired. That's community and communion. In order for connection to happen, we need to allow ourselves to be deeply and vulnerably seen. And this is relevant to our spiritual life as well. This whole psalm depicts the beauty of an intimate relationship with God. And there is such an obvious vulnerability present. The, the great warrior king, the giant slayer David, throws himself under the protection of a great universal king. Trusting in God's ability to protect him and guard him from all who pursue him. He vulnerably admits that, that God's love is more important to him than life itself, praising Yahweh's goodness to him in the past and bravely proclaiming his belief that God will satisfy him again. And he is vulnerable in his authentic cry for justice and his outrage at wrongdoing. David speaks to God in an intimate way in a vulnerable way. Our Lord Jesus does the same, and we can too. Our prayers don't need to be perfect, just honest. Christian spirituality is first and foremost an intimate relationship with God as it takes place in the midst of our messy and earthy lives. God wants us to dive into his arms when the going gets tough and to lean into the truths that we know about his character and his goodness, praising him for who he is and what he's done, not, not to walk away and let the hard times convince us that God does not care, because he does care. He wants to be with us and to connect with us. I would think all of us, particularly in this stressful time of lockdown, could benefit from bringing our hearts cry to God each day. If you don't already, can I encourage you to try speaking with Jesus about the various moments of your day throughout the various moments of your day when you wake up early in the morning or, or do your dishes or wash your car or at night before you go to bed. And, and speak to God as your friend and your loving Heavenly Father. My childhood babysitter often spoke fondly of her daily walks with Jesus and, and how she processed her joys and her struggles with him in this way. I've even heard of people having coffee with God in the morning or drawing as they express to him uh, his, their joys and, and their struggles. If these ideas seem foreign to you or somewhat disrespectful, they don't have to be. It's not disrespectful to be yourself with those you love or to say what you think and feel. It's authentic and vulnerable and enhances our intimacy with God. And this is how the Psalms teach us to pray. Bless
Thank you everyone for joining with us as we worship God this morning. May we be able to express his love and his forgiveness and his peace as we interact with people this week. I'm just going to read to you now out of Philippians chapter 4 to finish. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Take care, everyone.